you know, it keeps coming up. The, the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood portrayal, mm-hmm. it can be overblown on both sides because it's it's not the point of the movie. It's not a Bruce Lee right. biopic. I'm curious, first of all, like, what's your thoughts, untainted from whatever I'm about to say? Uh, yeah, so it's very interesting because I got involved in the controversy. I was brought, you know, reporters called me up and asked me. And then after I gave my opinion, then Shannon Lee, Bruce's daughter, weighed in with a very negative opinion. And then I ended up talking on the phone with Tarantino about about it. Wow. So, yeah. Let's get him so, on the call really quick. We're going to do a that's quick right. two-way conversation. No, just kidding. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, you know, the the weird thing is, Tarantino is one of the reasons I wanted to be a writer. You know, when I watched Pulp Fiction, I was like, I want to be a guy like that who can write something that amazing. Uh, But so I was watching the movie. I went in and I was like, I'm so excited. Tarantino is going to have Bruce Lee in his movie. And then it got to that moment and my heart sank and I was I felt a little gut punched. (laughs) Because what I thought he did was he took Bruce's characters and essentially made it a kind of SNL caricature of him. Right. It was kind of mocking of who Bruce Lee was. And it wasn't that he didn't, he, you know, he read my book, he had studied him. He is, he had taken aspects of Bruce's character and had simply exaggerated him for his own purposes to make the hero of the movie played by Brad Pitt more heroic by being able to kind of fight Bruce Lee and sort of knock him down a peg. So as Bruce Lee's biographer, I just felt that it was inaccurate. Um, but not wildly like it wasn't a terrible version of Bruce Lee. It just was the kind of slightly mocking unfair version. Um, And of course it it's Tarantino. And so everybody wanted to talk about it. And of course his daughter has a much more rosy version of Bruce Lee in in her mind. So she takes it personally and then it becomes a big argument and the movie got banned in China because of it. So uh, it had real financial consequences. Uh, and I don't think that should ever happen to any artist, you know, right. T- Tarantino can make whatever movie he wants. And we, as an audience can say what we like and don't like about it. I love the movie. I disliked his portrayal of Bruce Lee. I thought it was unfair in the way that he also portrayed, uh, you know, Steve McQueen or Sharon Tate, uh, historical figures in a very sympathetic light. So I thought he was very sensitive about those characters, but not nearly as sensitive about Bruce. Um, and yeah. that I thought the difference between those two, uh, given that they're the white characters and Bruce Lee is one of the few <laughs> non-white right. characters in the movie, I thought that that was problematic. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely understand now because when I first watched the movie, I had, again, I'd never seen sure. a film, you know, I'd, I'd seen his influences and knew I could picture him in my mind and some of the quotes <clears> and things, <throat> but watching the film, it didn't bother that scene happened. And right. I thought, you know, oh, it's fun. Tarantino throwing a real historical character and had right. Cliff Booth look really cool by taking him out, you know, or tricking him. And and now I kind of understand both sides of it. So I understand I understand where uh, Bruce Lee's daughter is coming from, obviously. Um, and, and Tarantino even admits, you know, he sees where that's coming from and the frustration. Sure. But what's, you know, I feel still mixed on the portrayal you know, because, and I think, honestly, I think it's the novel where I, you know, now it's hard to separate the novel and the film. Cause I think the novel gives a lot better, mm. you know, version of that and, and the, the strategy in Cliff's mind and the mm-hmm. way that that played out, but it's obvious Cl- Cliff tricked him. That's how he was able to do it. He tricked him. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, it's, 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 it's explained more in the book, but the thing is like, they, they do a, they do a, a three fall, a, a two falls out of three contest. Mm-hmm. So Cliff loves shit like that, you know, uh, uh, he, and he has a method and his method is to give the guy the first fall. <laughs> okay. Do your fucking move, dude. Right. Let me see your move. All right. And he gives him no resistance whatsoever. The guy does the move. He knocks him on his ass. And Cliff, and there's, there's like four different ways Bruce could have come at him the second time that Cliff would, would have had very little defense against. But most of the time, if, if a, a guy has a particular move and it looks like the guy's a lunkhead, just a big mouth who can't really defend himself, they do the second move again. I mean, they, they do the first move again, mm-hmm. second time. Well, now Cliff knows what it is. 
So he prepares for it. He pivots. He catches him. He throws his ass into the car. Right. You know, and now the third time will be the charm and he gets broken up. But he just tricked him. And Bruce realized he got tricked. If, if, if Cliff hadn't been so vicious, he could have even appreciated it. What is really interesting to me is um, something that Shannon Lee brought up that was, you know, it, it just gave me something to think about was, you know, Kill Bill's very inspired by Bruce Lee. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's so much. And she, you know, she mentioned how much he avoided, you know, referencing the influence of Bruce Lee. And then in this portrayal, there's like this kind of, it does feel kind of like there's a some kind of, she said like a vendetta, but it kind of does feel like that when you hear the interviews, like he seems very upset. And I think it's just because yeah. he's getting asked about it so much, sure. but you know, he does cite, I think it was on Rogan. He cited your mm-hmm. um, book and, you know, the disdain for American stuff. Many said he pulled from there, which wasn't yeah. quite accurate. So no, it, it, it's just an interesting thing seeing this happen. And I think it's kind of unfortunate because on the one hand, it's Tarantino being Tarantino. So I feel like he's known for taking characters and just doing some broad yep. version of them. On the other hand, I get the representation part and where she's coming from. So what is it in your book that Tarantino read that gave him the depiction of Bruce Lee that we ended up seeing once, once upon a time in Hollywood, mm-hmm. because it seems like there was almost a misreading of your text that he used as a foundational piece for a lot of this. Yeah. So uh, what he referenced in Rogan, and I think it's interesting. He, um, he keeps coming back to this. I mean, he, he reached out and called me. So this is something that really bugs him. Um, and my, you know, my reaction was you're Tarantino. What do you care? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's the thing about sensitive artists. Like what makes Tarantino great is he's somebody who worries about this stuff even after the fact. Right. Um, and you know, all respect to him. He's one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. Uh, and this is a minor, tiny little issue. So uh, you know, tempest in a teacup, but yeah, it's, it's one scene in a yes, massive film. It's yeah. Three minutes long in a massive film. Uh, but the issue that he brought up on Rogan was in on the green Hornet. Um, Bruce Lee was trying to do Bruce Lee choreography and he was dealing with Western guys trained in the John Wayne punch. So Bruce Lee was like, let me just throw three punches here and a kick and a knee. And they're like, dude, I only deal with the right hook. <laughs> Right. right. Uh, and so they were frustrated with this little Chinese guy who was trying to do all this stuff that they, A, didn't like and B, couldn't do. And in the process, occasionally Bruce Lee would bang him up. You know, they would like try the stunts and Bruce Lee would do something and they'd get a little bruised here or there. Uh, and so they complained about him. They were like, you know, this little punk Chinese guy is coming in here and get knocking us up. And these are like 45 year old, you know, old time TV stuntmen um, who probably are not the most racially enlightened either. Um, <laughs> sure. That's a good guess. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, they complained about it and they got to one of the head stuntmen, uh, uh, Judo Jean LaBelle. And he, he, there's a famous story he tells that's not totally confirmable that he like picked Bruce Lee up and walked around the set with him to kind of calm mm. him down. Uh, so there was this conflict and it was, racial and generational and also cultural um, yeah. on the set of, but it wasn't a big deal. And Bruce Lee would never have challenged a stuntman to a fight. Like this was his first job in Hollywood. Like yeah. he was a new guy on set. He was, the reason he was doing this was a lot because he was really nervous and he wanted to prove himself. Right. And so the way he portrays Bruce is as if he was already this iconic superstar who mm. was kind of, pissing down on this tiny stuntman who's barely got a job, which he wouldn't have been in 1969. That's right. So he takes sort of Bruce Lee from 1973, who's already super like international star and projects him back into 1967, Bruce Lee, who is essentially the new kid in school. Yeah. He's the only Asian on set. He's never had a Hollywood job. He's scared to death. He wants to prove himself. He's got a wife and a kid he can't afford to pay for if he loses this job. So he's not a guy who's going to do that. You're the one with the big mouth. And I would really enjoy closing it, especially in front of all my friends. Again, Tarantino, it's a movie. He can do whatever he wants. But if you ask if that's accurate of who Bruce Lee was on the set of The Green Hornet, it's not. He took some aspects, which is Bruce Lee did bang up stuntmen accidentally 
and turned it into kind of Bruce Lee intentionally trying to hurt. Schoolyard brawl. Yeah. Yeah. Between two people. Like, well, the stuntman hated Bruce. Really? On on uh, on on uh, uh, Green Hornet. No, it's in the it's in Matthew Polly's book. And before that, I, it's always been known. He wasn't the bully there. He was kind of like a hyper. Uh, the way Van Williams, who played the Green Hornet, described him is he was like my hyperactive younger brother, who was always bouncing around, and sh- yeah. he would be like, "Here, let me show you my new kick." Yeah. And trying to impress people because he was nervous, not because he was thought he was the biggest star in the world, because he wasn't, and he no. wasn't trying to hurt people. He was trying to earn his way to the top. And that's where I drew. So this is where I've kind of landed in some way is like, uh-huh. I, cause I listen and it it is weird. I will, I will agree with <sighs> Shannon Lee on the fact that it does feel like, like there's some personal beef with Bruce Lee. When you hear Tarantino <laughs> talk, I can understand his daughter having a problem with it. It's her fucking father. All right. right. I get that. But anybody else go oh, suck a dick. <laughs> You know, yeah. Tarantino usually will say that with his, with his, you know, his, uh, and that was a direct quote. If you're listening, I'm not just throwing in, um, but you know, if, you know, it, he does that with his other films, but it's usually just a casual, like, that oh, doesn't bother me. If you don't like it, you don't like it. If you don't like how I dealt with Hitler, or you don't like how I dealt with it. This feels very specific. And I think, do you think it's just because his, because it's, you know, Shannon Lee, also responding to it and he feels like there's this back and forth he has to get a little bit more aggressive like because it just feels strange that this is the thing he's chosen to really die on because i mean sharon tate i mean just dealing with that he got so much more flack than the bruce lee thing in the beginning um it just seems odd this is the thing that he's very defensive of i guess in the in the thing did did do you know any reason why this is something that's so important? Because I, I know he's a Bruce Lee fan. So, I mean, I got to assume there's some part of him too that's hurt that it is being interpreted this way. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think he actually has complicated feelings about Bruce Lee. He once said he liked the Bruce Lee knockoff movies better than the Bruce Lee movies. Mm, that's such which, a Tarantino thing to say. <laughs> it is. It totally is. And yeah. if you've watched any of the knockoff Bruce Lee movies, you know that that's insane. But yeah, um, but yes. Yeah, so um, I think... I think it has to do with the sensitivity to race in, in 19 and 2021 Yeah. versus, you know, if you remember, he got a bunch of grief for excessive use of the N word in his earlier movies, right? Did he? Do people talk about that? <laughs> uh, so, you know, when Spike Lee went after him and, right. you know, and some people doubled went down after, very yeah. heavily on that. Yeah. Yeah. So, but that was a time when you, when there was more, where it wasn't culturally quite as hard, difficult to sort of go against the current of whatever the politically yeah. correct thing was. And so I think, um, I think he felt a little blindsided. Um, and there's some reporting actually that on set, he wanted to do that scene even more extensively. And even mm-hmm. Brad Pitt was a little worried. Um, mm-hmm. There's a quote from one of Brad Pitt's people saying, dude, it's, Bruce Lee. I mean, you can't yeah. have me beat up Bruce Lee. Yeah. Um, so I think he probably pushed hard and got some grief um, early on and then was still got even more grief than he expected. Uh, and I, I also think it's this, which is, I feel he, he feels this movie is almost like the capstone of his career. Yeah, yeah. Because he keeps saying he's only going to make one more. And maybe make one more. Like, he's yeah. he's talked like this could be his masterpiece, his finished right. movie, which it could very well could be. I mean, it's a fantastic movie. It is. I love yeah. it. There is not one frame of your movies that I have not seen multiple times. But I have to say, I'm getting to a point here. Thank you. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. No, it's that. true. To me, this is your, your latest one is your peak. This is my favorite of all time. So what is this nonsense about you're only going to make one more movie? Uh, well. Come on. Yeah. Bad uh, idea. You know, well, uh, okay. I, you, I, I, look, it, 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 it's. Um, you're too young to quit. And you, uh, you're at the top of your game. Why? That's why I want to quit. How do you know it's the top? 
because I know film history, and from here on end, directors that's, do not get better. That's a terrible idea. First of all, you're judging yourself by other people. How do you fucking know? How, are you 58? Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. 58's yeah. the new 57. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, I mean, plenty of people have well, done... Well, one, I haven't retired yet. I, know, I still have but, another one to go. I think it may be that, is that he thought he delivered his masterpiece, and then there's this one thing everybody keeps digging at him at. You know, every interview they do, they go, oh, we loved your movie. What about Bruce Lee? What about his daughter? Da, da, da. Yeah. And and it's it's like that. It's like, you know, the thing, it's like someone saying your wife's nose is crooked. You're like, I love her. And she says, you're, it's crooked. Yeah. Like they keep digging at him about the one thing and it pisses him off. And the angrier he gets, the more defensive he gets. And the more outlandish, I mean, his responses. I mean, I thought like, yeah. gonna, it was kind of, it was, it's it's almost fun to watch it from the sidelines, you know, but yeah. it's, you know, cause it is, it's turn in, and that's just his personality too. He fixates on one thing, you yeah. know, and that's why um, I won't spend the rest of the time talking about Tarantino, but that's one of the things I love, you know, when he gives movie recommendations, you'll watch the movie and go like that movie was terrible, but yeah. you can see the one five uh-huh. second moment that he took yeah. for something else. And he, he's so fixated on that five second moment that a terrible movie became better than the right. superior films around it. Um, one last thing before we navigate from once upon a time in Hollywood, cause I want to talk about this because I, I want to confirm if this is, you know, like this is something I wish we could have covered in the film, but I understand why not. Um, but you know, one of the, one of the elements of Bruce's story, and I think it may have been one of Tarantino's early interviews. He talked about this on one of the podcasts or something, but um Roman Polanski thought Bruce Lee had committed mm-hmm. the Sharon Tate murders in yes. 69. Is that accurate? Yes. So, um, so what happened is Bruce Lee worked with Sharon state, uh, Sharon Tate on the wrecking crew. Right. So mm-hmm. they were friends and he was the fight choreographer. Um, and he basically taught her how to throw a sidekick. You know, <laughs> this was how early it was before yeah. everybody knew these things. Um, and so if you watch the, the movie, which is also shown in Tarantino's, uh, there's a scene where he, uh, where she does some, uh, very basic martial arts. Yeah. Uh, and she introduced him to her husband, Rowan Polanski and Rowan Polanski became one of Bruce Lee's students. They didn't train very often. It might've been eight or nine times, but you know, Bruce Lee went over the house and they considered each other friends in right. that Hollywood right. way where you consider the people who work for you friends. They were training after the Tate murders. Um, and the one thing, one of the things that um, happened, the, the police told Roman Polanski that one of the killers had lost his glasses at the scene of the crime. And so they were looking for somebody who had a certain prescription that was the same as the glasses found at the, the crime. Bruce Lee also wore glasses. He was nearsighted. And he was having a lesson with um, Roman. And he said, Roman, I, you know, after this lesson, I need to go get some glasses because I just lost mine. <laughs> and Jeez. Roman, and Roman, who was grieving, obviously, yeah. was also personally trying to investigate the murders himself. And so for a very brief moment, Roman thought, oh, my God, did Bruce Lee kill my wife? Wow. And so Polanski suggested, hey, why don't I take you to the store and I'll buy you the glasses as a gift? essentially trying to find out if Bruce Lee oh. was the killer. They drove to the store and Bruce Lee told the lady his prescription and it wasn't the same. And then uh-huh. Roman realized, ah, okay, it's not Bruce. He was relieved. He didn't think it was, but for that brief moment, <clears throat> he Did was I... driving in a car with Bruce Lee thinking maybe this is the man. So that's, you don't get much more pure cinema than that, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, that's something where, um, you know, it's something where like you wish you could have had that scene in yeah. the, but it wouldn't have made any sense no in the film but it, it is such a like when i first heard that story i was like that's such a gut that that would have been the most gut-wrenching feeling uh-huh. thinking yep. you know if and again with how random those looked you know like you got to be grasping at anything trying to figure out what this is and who did that's this right. um that's right. But that's the last thing I want to ask about was that because I, it sounds like one of those things, like it's almost too crazy. Like it's like, oh, Bruce Lee somehow connected to this in some way. Like there's, that's also part of this lore yeah. and this story that's still, there's elements of it that were 
trying to figure out. Um, I wanted to know if that was like more urban legend than real. No, life, it's, but. it's, it's true. And what I realized is um, you don't think about it, but particularly at that time, Hollywood was such a small community uh, yeah. that in many ways I felt like I was writing about a high school. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause you know, there was a period like Bruce Lee and Steve McQueen both dated the same woman, <laughs> wow. like, yeah. Sharon Farrell. Uh, and they're both married. So this was extra, extra marital. Um, and I, you know, they just all knew each other. You know, they worked on different films. They went to similar parties and they got to know each other. And so Bruce was the kind of new kid who was not that popular, but, you know, had some cool friends and he was trying to work his way up the high school. And if you think of Hollywood as a high school, you can understand it better. And so it's bizarre that he knew Sharon Tate trained with her. But and even more bizarre that Roman thought he killed her, but it's like a high school movie. But also not bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> also makes perfect sense that he would have met Roman Polanski at that time and worked with him in some capacity with exactly. how small knit that world was. 